Hey, and welcome back to the Kent ISD Remote Learning Bootcamp Organization and Communication Module. I'm Keith Tramper, your host for this module. And this segment is the third segment called Sharing Learning Content. In the last segment, we talked a bit about using LMSs to deliver all of the learning materials that we have to our students. But sometimes we have to do an additional step to make sure that they have access to it. Okay? It's not always easy, especially when you've got young students working with parents at home. It's not always easy to get into some of the learning materials that we use. So for textbooks, for instance, oftentimes you have to have some sort of a username and password to get in. So it might be a good idea to attach along with the assignment or the learning materials a tech support document that helps guide students through how to create an account or how to um, access the learning materials using their username and password. Remember, if you think back to module one, Ron talked about removing learning barriers. This is one of those opportunities to remove learning barriers. So let's talk about creative credit. Creative credit means giving credit to someone who created an original work. In this case, um, I'm going to use this image to illustrate a point here um, of this little baby alpaca. And this, in me giving creative credit for who created this, you can see down in the bottom of this slide in the video that this was created by a, a person named Catherine on Flickr, and I even gave the link to go out there and access it. That's called giving creative credit, or citing your sources you often hear. So I'm gonna take you through a thought experiment here. Let's say that you were out at a farm and you quickly took a picture of this baby alpaca. This was your picture, okay? And you thought it was awesome, so you shared it on social media with your friends so that they could see it too. You got a ton of likes and thought it was awesome, okay? From the minute that you took that picture, you had a copyright on it. The minute you create an original work and you have documentation to prove it, which when you take pictures, they have timestamps, that shows, or that gives you copyright for that material and everyone else who uses it has to ask permission for it. A lot of people think you have to go through a process to get something copyrighted. That's not totally true um, in order to do that. So let's say your baby alpaca picture went onto the internet through social media, it got spread all over the place, and Sunglasses R Us, this imaginary company I made up, um, picked up your image of the baby alpaca and loved it and used it to sell their sunglasses. And we find out later, you can kind of see at the bottom of this post, that there's been a lot of engagement with it. You can see that they probably made a lot of money. You've got, they've got people coming to their website and buying their sunglasses, mostly because of a picture that caught their attention in this ad. So I want you to put yourself in those shoes. How would you feel about that situation? Would it make a difference if Sunglasses R Us asked permission to use your photo, gave you credit as the creator, or paid to use your photo? Pause the video and think about that for a second. How would you feel? And would those things make a difference? So that little thought experiment sort of illustrates the need for creative credit and why it's important to cite the things that you're borrowing. Um, this is especially important in online learning when you might be tempted to just put your textbook online or grab materials from somewhere that you photocopied 10 years ago onto the internet for anybody to use. Um, there's some issues with that. So let me talk to you a little bit about some guidelines that I often share with students and teachers about creative credit. And then we'll get into like fair use, the law side of things. So the first thing when you're talking about creative credit is you should always check who owns something. Before you go out and share it, make sure you check who owns it. Get permission to use it if you can. Go and try to track down the publisher, the creator, and ask if it's okay if you use it. Most cases, they're going to say, yeah, that's okay, unless they're a textbook company, but we won't go there. Um, give credit to the creator. Uh, so whoever made that, Take time to say, this person made that. You'll see that in my slides and videos, all the icons, all the images that I've used are cited down in the bottom right corner of the screen. So you know where they came from, you know who created them. Um, in some cases, the author or the creator or publisher may want you to purchase a copy of it before you can share it. And that's okay too, that's just gonna have to make you think, okay, is this something that's worth spending the money on? 
Is it a critical part of my curriculum or my differentiation tools? And lastly, use it responsibly. Don't take the, the image or the article or the video out of context and repurpose it in a totally different way that is against what the author's initial intention was. So let's talk about fair use guidelines. And fair use, you, you often hear um, educators use as a way that they get around copyright. And yes, it's a tool that helps us utilize, um, utilize copyrighted material for learning purposes. But there's a couple catches within there that I want to make sure you're aware of, especially as you're sharing materials online. The first is that for fair use to apply, use a small amount of the original work. You can't use the whole thing in its entirety. Another point in fair use is reworking copyrighted material and using it in a different way, giving it a different purpose for what you're doing. For example, with my alpaca, the original creator made that so that it was just something that um, showed a baby alpaca, it was cute, right? But I reused it in a way that had a different purpose. I, I used it to tell a story and drive home a point. So I changed the purpose of that original work. The last thing, and maybe one of the most important things for people who are publishing to make money, is when you reuse their, their work, you need to make sure that you are not making a profit on it. Okay, if, you, if they can show that you are detracting from their sales, detracting from their ability to make money, because you're offering something that is the same or similar to theirs for free, um, that's when you can get yourself in a lot of legal trouble. So make sure that you're not making a profit on it or cutting into their sales. Um, even just giving things away for free um, still cuts into the profit of that company. So that's another way to think about it. One way to not have to worry a ton about these copyright concerns is to use open educational resources. You've probably heard the term, it's blown up in the past few years, but open educational resources at their core are educational materials that are free to use and distribute. Um, sometimes there's a couple of little catches that go with them, but for the most part, they can go out to any students, you can share them as much as you want, and they generally follow these five R's. So let's talk about the five R's. The first is that you can retain that OER, that learning material, meaning you can make and own your own copies of it as if it is something that you've purchased, as if it is your own. The second is reuse. That means that you can use that thing in lots of different ways without having to worry about the context that you're using it in. The third is revise, meaning you can adapt, you can modify, you can improve upon someone else's work. In fact, that's a big part of OERs, is that you take what someone else did, improve it, and then share it back out so others can use that material. Remixing is a way of taking a few different OER resources and putting them together into one thing. So you might find one website has a lot of great material, but they're missing something. And another website's got that exact thing that you're looking for. You can take the two and combine them without any concerns inside of OERs. The last R is redistribute, meaning that you can take that material and you can give it out to your students, to your parents, to your community members, um, anyone in the community that could benefit from that OER. So those are the five R's of OER. Again, I said it's kind of blown up in the past few years. I'm going to link in our guide doc one specific place that I would send you to that MDE and REMC have been collaborating on to develop a repository of lots of different OERs that are vetted in Michigan. There are two deliverables for this segment. The first is to answer this question. What creative credit and copyright considerations will you focus on this year? The second is to review Go Open Michigan, and I've attached a link inside of the guide doc for you to click and go there easily. Identify one OER that you liked and how it might support learning in your classroom. Once you're done with those, your segment three is done and we'll see you in segment four.